Hi everyone, my name is Michael Kuligowski and I work within the Sydney Microscopy and Microanalysis team at the University of Sydney. My background is in confocal and live animal multiphoton imaging and also performing image analysis, which is what I want to talk to you about today. So image analysis. So when we want to know what something means, like image analysis, we go to Google and ask Wikipedia for the definition. And that's what I've done here. So image analysis is the extraction of meaningful information from images, mainly from digital images by means of digital imaging processing techniques. Now for the most important part of this statement, meaningful information. Any image can look nice, be informative, be educational, but in terms of image analysis, we want to extract the meaningful information from the image. But what exactly is meaningful information? So let's take a sample image. Let's talk about this. So here is a nice photograph of a bridge. I left it in black and white, so we don't need to worry about any of the color information. But what meaningful information is present? Well, lots actually. As you can see, we have information about the name, the width and height of the image, the overall size, how big the pixels are, the bit depth, the display range amongst lots of other things. Now this information may be very important for you if you want to know the size or the name of the image, but there are other things we can get meaningful information about. For example, we could look at the brightness of the image. This graph shows all of the pixels on a graph being, uh, with zero being pure black and 255 being pure white. All of the pixels in the image fit somewhere in between these two points. You might be interested in how bright or dark the image is, and you might also be interested in knowing where the pixels are and how bright and dark they are. So, this image on the right is a small zoomed in area of the bridge picture. It has been zoomed in so far that each of the orange squares actually represent one pixel. Then instead of showing the picture, we told the computer to display the brightness of each of the pixels. We can now see the numbers range uh, quite a bit from low 30s to almost 200. Now, this is very informative, but is it meaningful? And that actually comes down to you. So, you can analyze anything. I had researchers previously come up to me and ask my assistance in image analysis. I have seen them working for many weeks, if not months, in the facility, imaging uh, day after day. So they definitely have data. So ask them, what analysis do you want to perform? And they reply with everything. Now this probably makes sense to them, so ask again, uh, and ask if they can please be more specific. And they still reply with everything. Well, the first thing when it comes to acquiring data is knowing the analysis you need to perform so that you can acquire the most appropriate image. And we're gonna discuss this more later. But what types of analysis can you perform on images? Well, you can perform any of the things listed here. You can measure objects in 2D and in 3D. You can track objects like living cells in tissue over time. You can count cells or colonies, perform FRET calculations, or just measure the diameter of your objects. There are many more things you can do. Some of them are listed here. Some techniques are specific for more material science based images, such as porosity, like in concrete, for example. But this technique can also be used to examine vesicles within a cell. Or something as specific as longest path can be used to, uh, for things like tracking cells in a lymph node, to tracking bird migration using satellite imaging. There are so many different types of analysis tools that it is really important that you use the one to try and get the meaningful information you're interested in. However, they all work in a very similar uh, way in the steps that they perform. And let me illustrate this. Whenever you start with any type of image analysis, you need to follow the same steps. You need to somehow get the image into the software that you are going to use. Then you need to somehow process it. This might include running filters like a Gaussian filter or a deblurring filter. You might need to change the contrast of the image. Then once you have the image, you need to tell the computer what you're trying to measure. 
and this is called segmentation or segmenting the image into the areas that you're interested in. As you can see here, the computer was instructed to identify the teeth from the X-ray image. We have also asked the computer to identify the bone at the top of the teeth. Then once these areas have been segmented into what you want to analyze, then you need to measure them and perform statistics and interrogate the data to get the meaningful information you require. And there are many software packages which will allow you to do this. I have a very short table here of some of the software packages available. Some of these are very expensive, costing well over thirty to fifty thousand dollars, and others are totally free. You might even recognize some of them. Let me discuss a few in a bit more detail. So the ones highlighted in green are the ones we have available in some form at the University of Sydney. A Mira or a Visa is an extremely powerful program. It can be used very quickly to perform very demanding analysis quite easily. The workflows of this program are really good and can be used for batch processing as well. Unfortunately, this is one of the software packages which is extremely expensive. So we only have a few licenses within the university. However, contrasted, ImageJ or Fiji is a totally free software package, which you can download and customize to do any type of analysis you want to. As it is free and open source, meaning that you can download the base code and alter it any way you want to, researchers all around the world have written and freely released plugins that will perform any type of analysis you can dream of. Our team and most image analysis specialists from all around the world really like this software due to the cost, but also as it is totally customizable to perform any type of analysis you want. iMod is another package which is widely used within the university. It was originally designed for EM image reconstruction, image segmentation, 3D mesh modeling, and analysis of 2 and 3D data. It is also free and an extremely powerful image software package. Huygens Professional is another expensive software package which the university was able to purchase and allow all members of the University of Sydney who have a uni key and are on site to use. It is a 3D deconvolution package, uh, but also does tracking, co-localization, and all the measurements that you would normally want to do for your analysis. It is very good at utilizing high-end graphics cards to allow processing of images much faster than other software. All of these packages are very good and will allow you to perform the analysis you require. The paid packages might have a very nice user interface and be easier to use at the start, but the free software packages are totally customizable for the analysis you need to perform. Before heading more into this, let's step back and have a look at a brief history of digital images. The first digital photo was taken in 1957 when Russell Kirsch made a 176 by 176 pixel digital image by scanning a photograph of his three month old son. The low resolution um, was due to the fact that the computer they used wasn't capable of storing any more information. He used a standard electronic automatic computer or a SIAC and a PMT and a drum scanner. It was a massive 0.03 megapixels and had a one bit resolution. Also, just as an aside, this is what the advanced SIAC computer looked like. It was huge. Now let's step forward just a few years and look at a slightly higher resolution digital image. This is a combined image of Mont Blanc, Europe's highest mountain and has a massive resolution of 365 gigapixels. It is a compilation from a team of photographers who stitched over 11,000 individual high-end resolution photographs to produce this masterpiece. And just to show that it was not just a beautiful image, just to the left of the middle of the screen, if you zoom in, you can actually see mountaineers climbing near the top of the peak, and here we've zoomed in. However, most researchers do not require this level of resolution. So let's talk about this and let's talk about sampling. So 
Sampling refers to how many spots we're going to measure, and then quantitization is how accurately we're going to measure them. Shown here is a young starfish captured by a light microscope. Using the analog signal on the left, you can make out the structure as well as the differences in shading in the different parts of the starfish. However, when we change to a digital signal, we get a series of squares, which can be thought of as pixels within the camera, and also shown is to pixel information or brightness on the right. So how much is enough? That is the big question. Well, that depends on what you're trying to measure and what your scientific question is. Let me give you an example. So let's have a look at this image. You can see we have already displayed a lot of meaningful information about the image. We have the image size, a graph with the pixel intensity, also indicating that this image is 8-bit, and a small section of the image which has been zoomed in showing uh, the individual pixel intensities. Let's change the sampling of this image. So let's look at these two images. They look quite close to each other, but if you look closely to the image on the right, it is not as crisp, clear or sharp as the image on the left. Let's take uh, this processing one step further. Now you can see clearly that the image on the right is not as clear as the image on the left. Even further, you can see that the image is less and less clear. And then on this last image, you might even be able to see the little boxes that have made up the altered image. We change the sampling of these images. So you can magnify and magnify, but it's still blurry. So it all comes down to resolution and sampling. Another way to think of sampling, specifically on light microscopes, is how big the pixel size is going to be. Now that if you've seen the images in comparison to each other, you can understand what sampling is. Zooming in does not make the image better, but it can alter the final result. By changing the sampling size of the image, you can increase the intensity of the images. Shown here, um, Shown here, the bottom line is showing the intensity of the original image. So the bright orange yellow line at the bottom shows the intensity of the image, and you can see it's quite low. Then as you decrease the sampling or resolution, you can see that the blue, the brown, and then the orange squared line gets higher in intensity, although it has less data points. You can think of, the, uh, of this using the term binning where you would take a box of two by two pixels and then change them into one new large pixels. They would collect four times more light than the original small pixel, but your resolution will not be as high. Then you can also do this with a three by three box of pixels, now being one new large pixels, and this gives you nine times the original intensity. And a four by four box of pixels would give you 16 times the intensity, and a 5x5 five five box would give you 25 times the intensity, and so on. So by binning or reducing the sampling, you can increase the amount of light that you're collecting, which may mean that you're able to measure the structure you're interested in above background in a statistically significant way. But there are also trade-offs in your imaging. So. Apart from sampling, which we just spoke of, there is another term called quantitization, which is a measure of the amount of bits or information within your image. You may have heard people discussing 8-bit this or 16-bit that, and were not sure what they were talking about. Well, let's discuss this now and ensure that it is clear and easy to understand. Basically, bit depth is the number of shades within your image. So a one-bit image has two shades, black or white, and this is shown on the extreme, extreme left of the photo. Then a four-bit image has two to the power of four, so it has 16 shades, and that's shown in the middle image. And then 
an 8-bit image is 2 to the power of 8, so it has 255 shades within its images. And that's shown on the right. So let's take an image as an example. So this image is in color, so let's change it into um, grayscale, and let's leave it in its original 8-bit, all shades within the image. So the graph on the right shows a line profile or the brightness of the pixels which go across the image where the line is. And you can see the line um, across the duck horse or horse duck from left to right. You can see that the background grass has low brightness, while the duck horse or horse duck is much brighter. Now let's change the bit depth and see what happens. So this image now has seven bit, which is 128 levels or shades. This image now has 6 bit or 64 levels, and you can see how the image is slowly starting to change. This image now has 5 bit or only 32 levels. This image now has 4 bit or only 16 levels. And this image now has 3 bit or 8 levels. This image now has 2 bit or only 4 levels, and taking it to the extreme, the final image only has 1 bit or two levels within the image. It's a little bit hard to make out. The line profile now shows the grass on the horse duck is being as different, but is no longer any other information present, as you can see here in the new graph. Bit depth depends on your microscope and the type of detector you are using. Some systems that we have at the University of Sydney have 8-bit or even 16 cameras or detectors. We have advanced imaging techniques like FLIM, which can use up to 32-bit data. Shown at the bottom of the screen is a dragonfly in the rain. You can see how the image looks. Difference between 1-bit on the left to 8-bit grayscale to then 16-bit color and 24-bit color. Most monitors do not even work in the true color range and you have to have a specially purchased and calibrated monitor to display these colors, meaning that the dragonflies probably look the same for you during this presentation. Let's have a look in a bit more data, in a bit more detail. If you're using a high-end monitor at the moment, you might be able to make out the difference between the images, but they aren't quite subtle and very hard to see. Now let's think about your experiments. Do you need to use eight or 16-bit images for your acquisitions. Most researchers would probably just state to collect the highest bit depth and not worry too much about this. But apart from taking much longer for your acquisition, it can actually mean that the data you save is astronomical in size. So let's take this example. You can see that the monochrome images are twice as big between the 8 and 16-bit files in the table but you may have three channels. So that would mean that your data sets are six times larger. We typically save files that are hundreds of megabytes in size, and this can easily turn into thousands of megabytes or several gigabytes per file. Considering each experiment typically has hundreds of files or images, you can now see how increasing the bit depth from eight to 16 bits can mean that you can now easily end up with many terabytes of data per single experiment. Also, just as an aside, if you're saving your data in 16-bit as compared to 8-bit, just to see a difference within your experimental groups, it will not be statistically significant. What I mean by this is that the brightness of your protein, for example, cannot be observed using 255 intensity values and you need to change this to over 4,000 intensity values just to see a difference in your experimental groups, there is no difference between them. So let's quickly discuss colours and the two main colour spaces, CMYK and RGB. RGB is an additive colour model, and this is green plus red is yellow, red plus red plus blue equals white. And this is typically used in digital displays like monitors, phones, TVs, etc. CMYK is a subtractive color model. Magenta minus yellow equals red. 
magenta minus yellow minus cyan equals black. And this is used in printing and photography through filters. This is why when you have something displayed on your high-end computer monitor and it's printed out, it will no doubt look different in the CMYK. In microscopy, we typically use RGB. And before I go on to the next page, I have to apologize for the representative image. I did not choose it. And I don't know why out of all the images on the internet, Matt needed to choose this one. Maybe he secretly, secretly likes an extremely gaze. But let's move on. What can be seen here is an image which has been composed of red, green, and blue channels. And you can see these here. If you look at the images on the right, they have been split into the RGB colors for you to observe. Microscopists are used to looking at individual channels as they allow them to gauge and set up their imaging thresholds and intensities correctly. That was just for Matt. Now let's talk about file formats. There are many different ways to save your files following acquisition. The main way should be to save your data using the proprietary file format of that software package. This type of file is always lossless, meaning it has all the information of the image and is quite large in size. However, it is smaller than a comparable TIFF format. <coughs> Please do not save your data in a file format like a JPEG, which compresses the file before saving. This type of file is called lossy, as it actually throws away data which is contained within the image. Typically, most phones take photos and save them as JPEGs. They do this by using very clever software, which reduces the file size, but still making the photo look pretty good. This is really all that most people need when taking snapshots. However, if you take these images, so these are the original images, saved as different sorts of JPEGs, and now we're going to zoom. So again, for the original photo, it might be fine, but you've literally thrown away valuable data, and it means that your images are now not analyzable. You might be able to see that the original large image doesn't look too bad, but with more and more compression or throwing away data, the image looks worse and worse. So just don't save your data in a lossy format. Just use the proprietary format that the software package allows you to save as. This format will be readable by all the software packages available and contain all the raw data. If you save it to another format, please only use non-compressible TIFF images. This will ensure that your image has all the metadata or information about how the image was acquired embedded into the file. Now also, apart from saving the data in a proprietary format so you don't lose any information, you should also save it in the proprietary format so there is no doubt that you actually took the image and there is no tampering involved. Microscopes embed the data about the day, time, magnification, and such things as exposure, time, or laser power, or even temperature. They hold a wealth of information, and this cannot easily be reproduced. You should always save this file and then have another uh, copy that you perform your analysis on, so you can track the analysis and how the flow from image to data to publication has been done. As a role in image analysis, I was called to look at a paper uh, that had some questionable, questionable microscopy images a few years ago. The results just seemed too good to be true. So I asked for the raw data images from the microscope. The lab sent me a stack of images and I went through each and every one. I could tell everything from the images, who was logged into the software at the time, the magnification, the laser power, etc. I could read into all the data and it looked correct. Then I came to the negative control image, you know, the one that shows the background staining or autofluorescence, and this image is the one that looked weird. It was black, like really black, not like a speck of fluorescence was on the screen. Now this could be real, it has happened before, but it's also strange. So I looked at the image metadata and there wasn't any. It wasn't that it was stripped away, 
It was a simple 1024 by 1024 image with no data embedded. It was also pure black. It looked as if someone had opened up a paint program, made a 1024 by 1024 image with a black background and used this as a background control image. Now, I'm not saying this to scare anyone, as I know everyone here will do the correct thing, but always save the data in the proprietary format and you won't have any issues like this. Now on to some more fun stuff. So we have a variety of software packages at the university for you all to utilize. They are incredibly powerful. Shown here are some of the popular ones, Huygens. We have a site license, so you can load this onto personal or work computers, which are on the university network, and you require a UniKey login. Catan, we have a center license, and it's a distributor to pre-approved workstations across the university. Aviso, we have three floating licenses for Sydney microscopy and microanalysis. And Fiji, this one's totally free. You can download it and put it on every computer you want. We also have a few other software packages. This is a list of some of the other ones available at the university. As I said, ImageJ or Fiji is free, and you can download this yourself. All the other ones require specialized software keys, licenses, and you would need to contact the analysis team to find out how to access them. Let's go over some of these in a bit more detail. So, we have a site license of Huygens Professional at the University of Sydney. This means that anyone who is connected to the physical network at the university and has a Unikey can download a full version of this software and use it on either laboratory or their personal computers. It is a very powerful piece of software, which primarily performs deconvolution, which is, which is where it puts scattered light back into its correct place within the image. And I'll discuss this later in the talk. Huygens is also extremely good at 3D and 4D rendering, object segmentation, object tracking, co-localization, and can also do any of these processes on a batch of files. This software package can also take advantage of high-end and very high-end graphics cards to speed up your analysis. Huygens and also Fiji are probably the two most useful software analysis packages which we have. So Fiji is literally ImageJ2 and actually stands for Fiji is just ImageJ. With the original ImageJ, you had to manually download the software and then install and then download and install each of the plugins to ensure they're working correctly. This could be quite tricky and sometimes you need to be quite good with computers to figure out how all this worked. So in the Fiji version, everything is included. All the modules or plugins can be um, downloaded in a wizard style form, which makes it very easy to use. Also, it is totally open source, which many scientists from all around the world have made their own plugins to measure, render, or process pretty much anything you can imagine, and all of these are freely available. Also using batch processing commands within Fiji, or a little bit of scripting, most processes can be automated and then applied to batches of files. With a little bit of work, this can be very useful for software package, and I suggest you all try this when you can. However, the university does have other software packages, such as NIS Elements, MATLAB, Inform, Velocity, just to name a few. Some of these are unsupported, meaning that we just don't have the resources to assist you with these packages, and others, like NIS Elements, are supported by the Light and Optical team and also by the Nikon reps. Overall, the message is there are many software packages available, and please feel free to ask uh, us so that we can assist you with your analysis. But let's step back a moment. Before doing any analysis, well, actually before collecting any data, you should have a question you would like to answer. You would normally sit down with your supervisor and design the experiment, then go collect some data. Don't collect all your data here, just do a pilot study and get a few images. Then process and analyze the images and see what data you have. Then review the results to see if you need to change the experimental design. Do you, for example, 
need to have any further controls? Do you need to increase the resolution of your scans or change the step size in your Z-Stacks? Or do you just need to acquire more images so you can count the number of events required for your project? Then go through the process again and ensure that everything is working well before you start collecting your whole project's data. However, it's never quite that easy. You should constantly be reviewing and discussing the project with your supervisor to ensure you're getting the data that you need in the most optimized way possible. Now let's finish off this presentation with a few real world examples. This is an image showing the chromosomes from a sea urchin. The first image on the left shows a typical confocal image, which has some blurring of the image even after the background has been removed. We normally correct this by filtering the sample so we only have the brightest parts that are left, and this is shown in the middle image. However, the best way to actually perform this 3D rendering is to deconvolve it. This is a technique which takes out of focus light and puts it back where it should be. Now, this is done by taking images of very small beads at very high magnification on the microscope that you were using for your project. And then it applies a correction algorithm, taking all the out of focus scattered light and putting it back to where it should be within a ball, because we know that the ball is spherical. Then by taking this algorithm and applying it to the whole image of the chromosomes to put all the light back where it should be. The image looks visually more appealing, but the data is also much more powerful. It allows you to see things in greater resolution and perform more precise measurements. The increase in resolution is much more clearly seen in this example. This example really shows what deconvolution can do to an image. If you just concentrate on the bottom row of the panel, which are the 3D renderings of the dendritic tree, the typical image you'll get straight off the confocal uh, is shown on the left. Then typically you would perform a standard cleanup of the image which would include removing the background, some sort of filtering to get the image as clean as possible. And I mean, this image does look good. And you can see in the green areas on the red dendrite, and you can get a lot of information from this image. However, let's take the same original image you acquired from the confocal, and then just apply the algorithm to put the out of focus or scattered light back into its correct place. And you end up with an image shown on the bottom right. You can clearly see that this image is much more detailed. The dendritic processes are much more distinct, narrower, and have lots of projections. Then the green parts are very clear, quite small, well, much smaller than the uh, image which has gone through the standard cleanup. And there you can measure their size correctly. You can see how this powerful technique allows you to get very clean images from your acquired uh, images which can then be analyzed to get the meaningful data you need. Another real world example is shown here, where we're looking at an XID image of an implant, particularly looking at the surface, where the manufacturer wanted to know how smooth or rough it was. By taking the raw image, which is shown in gray, and processing the data both in Aviso and then in Fiji, you can get the surface information and also the cross sections at the outside of the implant. This is a really good example where it makes more sense to use two software packages to get the information you require. There is always a way to get meaningful information that you require, and we're always here to help. So what can the team do for you? Well, we're here to assist you with your research. We can guide you and provide assistance with optimizing fluorophore selection for our microscopes, to help set up and optimize the microscope for you, to train you on how to use it, then once the data is acquired, to guide your analysis and then if possible, suggest automated or batch processing techniques to save you time. This is where macro development comes in. We can assist you with information or help you problem solve, but we're not going to write the code for you. Please contact us via the email listed so that we can help with your research. However, what we will not do for you is write your thesis, get your data or perform your analysis. As I said before, we're here to help guide you on your scientific journey, not do all the work for you. And finally, have a clear question in mind. Avoid collecting data just because you can. 
Why? It speeds up analysis and ensures that you don't clutter up your research plan. So thank you very much for all your time today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned something from it. And please contact us if we can help you in any way with your research. Thank you.